What if I told you that there was a career path more competitive than acting, modeling, fashion, and the arts? But this is a career in the sciences, where the average pay is only around $35,000 a year. And it's unlikely, even if you're wildly successful, to make six figures in this industry. This job requires years of volunteering, working for free, sometimes even paying to work. And when a lucky candidate does get a paid position, you barely make minimum wage. This job requires constant moves, hazardous work conditions, and living in some of the most inhospitable places on the planet. Many employers don't provide travel stipends or health insurance. In fact, many higher-ups are often abusive and negligent to their unpaid staff and workers. It's no surprise that mental health problems are rampant in this industry as are financial strains and burdens. Would you take this job? What if I told you this job is essential for thriving life on our planet. Do you know what this job is? This is the job and often plight of a wildlife biologist. Now, this is an oversimplification, a worst case scenario. But unfortunately, the truth isn't too far away. How did this happen? How did we get here? Well, let's back up a little bit. We know, all know the environmental problems we face, climate change, biodiversity loss, and natural disasters. But if you don't, or have been living under a rock, here's a somewhat depressing recap. The science is clear. Climate change will affect us all in disastrous, significant ways. Sadly, the world's poorest individuals will suffer the most even though less developed countries have done the least to contribute to this global problem. Furthermore, humans are irreparably destroying our planet's vast resources. Our Earth has built-in ecosystem services, which are the natural benefits that healthy functioning ecosystems provide to us for free. Things like water filtration, pollination, and carbon sequestration are valued at 46 trillion US dollars per year. Some estimates even go as high as 140 trillion dollars. That means in our global economy, we, it will cost us that amount to replace what the Earth provides for free. And it's not just tangible benefits. I want you to close your eyes for a second. Natural landscape. Maybe it's a sandy beach, or a dense forest, or a snow-capped mountain. Breathe in the fresh, clean air. Picture the clear, pristine view. Now, open your eyes and think, can you put a price on this beauty? How do you quantify natural beauty? All of this is currently available to us for free but it comes at a cost. And the people who work to protect these natural landscapes are not getting paid. We are the field technicians and wildlife biologists who are constantly undervalued and underfunded. But I know this firsthand, but I do this work anyway, despite the extreme eco-anxiety and depression I feel when I consider the state of our planet. The fear and guilt did nothing to solve the world's problems. So I decided to do something about it. I came of age in the early 2000s where information about the melting ice caps and stranded polar bears was just starting to hit mass media, disseminated by this new thing called the internet. <laughs> but as a sensitive child and now an overly empathetic adult, I wanted to help solve these problems. I wanted to do something about it. But the story that propelled me most into environmental action was that of Chico Mendes, a brave Brazilian who was assassinated while protecting his rainforest, his community, and his livelihood in the face of deforestation and logging. His story 
got me outside of my American suburban worldview. And maybe to this day why I'm so fascinated by the Amazon. So I had my plan. Become a one woman, real life Captain Planet. <laughs> <laughs> Defender of our Earth, single handedly. How? No clue. <laughs> but it seemed like studying biology was a good place to start. So I did that and expected to get a job right out of undergrad. Wait, what's that? I need a, a master's? Okay, check. Got my master's. It's time for that job. <laughs> this is what's supposed to happen, right? You finish grad school, and then you can finally pay back all of those loans. Not in the conservation industry. You see, for us, there are three main career paths you can choose from. Government work, research and academia, and nonprofit or NGOs. The latter two rely on very limited streams of funding. Grants, which are inconsistent and very hard to obtain, especially for conservation research, and fundraising. If you work in the nonprofit sector, you know it's not like people are lining up to give you money. And if they are, please tell me your secrets. <laughs> And that's it. The whole conservation sector is balanced on these two thin, unstable stilts of revenue. In a capitalistic society, conservation provides no tangible benefit. How does a wildlife study help global markets? It doesn't. And a tree is worth more dead than alive. So our industry has a basic economics problem. We have an undersupply of jobs and funds and an overdemand of people willing to work in the industry. With products, this leads to price gouging. But with jobs, this leads to exploitation. There's just simply too many people who want to work in wildlife and not enough jobs. I know what you might be thinking, not enough conservation jobs, Oh well, those snowflake millennials should just work in an office like the rest of us and be grateful for what they have. But there's a really, a, a whole bunch of systemic problems that come with this dynamic. I'll name two. First, organizations can take adv advantage of our passion and exploit their workers. Like I said, it was so hard to find a career, I had to work temporary, seasonal jobs that required short-term field assistance. Many of these positions have set stipends which are very low. And then you work 10, 11, 12 hours a day for weeks on end in strenuous conditions in order to get a project done. I did the math for one of these jobs and it came down to actually $4 an hour. I kid you not. And I have a master's degree. And the sad thing is, this is generous. Some organizations ask you to work for free, and the very worst ask you to pay to work a job. I, and so many like me, are sick of the abuse and manipulation. In fact, there's an entire community called Lonely Conservationists that, <laughs> it's true, that is dedicated to telling our stories. But we do this because they've said, this is the only way to work in wildlife. So we put our heads down, don't complain, and plow through, hoping to get one of those rare coveted jobs. And the worst part is, if you can't find a job in conservation, it not only feels like a personal failure, but it feels like a failure to that vow we made to protect our planet. We, are, we suffer extreme burnout and our passion disappears in a puff of smoke. But we need that passion, that fire, to keep burning. Not only is exploitation rampant, but in our industry there are major diversity challenges. So on all levels, socioeconomic, race, class, education, and so on. I mean, if you think about it, who can afford to 
<laughs> volunteer for years trying to get a minimum wage job. Not people who are poor. That means most of the career conservationists come from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. They have parents or partners that they can fall back on for support when pay is inconsistent or non-existent. Sadly, conservation has become generally a privileged white person's career. And we must be intentional to include those of lower economic backgrounds, indigenous cultures, and others who are excluded and marginalized from this work. Their voices and perspectives are essential for effective conservation. Look, we are killing off our planet. Mass extinction is imminent, and people are dying. But we don't have the luxury of time. I know, and now I'm telling you we need to worry about diversity and equity and conservation jobs? Thanks for the optimistic talk, Laura. But I know that there is enough money in our global economy to solve the world's problems. Unfortunately, there's just no incentive for doing so. And unfortunately, many conservation organizations are reliant on inconsistent government aid, uh, scattered short-term grants, and private donations. This is absolutely not sustainable. So what can we do? Well, let's flip the script. I made it my mission to find out what conservation actually needs. Clearly, we need jobs and we need money. <laughs> but you can't just throw money at a problem and expect it to solve everything. Conservation also needs creative, unique ways for people to see and experience and appreciate nature. For when they can become immersed in it, then they will value it. And here's the kicker. Conservation also needs accountability. It's not just about exploitation and jobs. In fact, for many organizations to make revenue, they charge volunteers and tourists to come out and interact with charismatic species of wildlife, especially in unique tropical locations. Now, I'm all for getting money to wildlife conservation, but this can have some downsides too. So I'm sure you're probably aware animal welfare um, gets, out the, gets thrown out the window in order to make a profit. And so animals are unnecessarily handled, harassed, there's improper vet care, and unethical living conditions, so they can get money. But thankfully, this problem has been brought to the, uh, the public eye lately. Looking at you, Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> but second, and more subversive, is that companies will actually choose to exploit their volunteers by cleverly marketing conservation adventures and then charging exorbitant fees. I know someone who paid thousands of dollars for a trip to the Amazon, thinking she would get knowledge and skills. Instead, she was told to lay concrete her whole trip, and then was gaslit into thinking that this is normal. It's not. But even if someone has a great travel experience, this can hinder progress in diversity and equity in our industry. I mean, it's so competitive, that if a, a career hopeful can just pay a fee to boost their resume. This provides an unjust disadvantage for those who don't have the means to travel and further widens that gap of privilege. We can do something about this, though. We can combine all of those needs of conservation and provide ethical trips and experiences that help redistribute wealth to the most beneficial conservation groups. You know, the ones that hire locals at a fair wage, uh, don't mishandle animals, and mistreat their volunteers, or the ones that don't promote neocolonialism or parachute science. Oh, and they must have effective conservation, too. I recently returned from a trip to the Amazon. I had a great time. I worked with a local nonprofit, one that was actually run by a white Westerner. 
Initially, I felt a bit icky. I hate this idea of the white savior complex where rich people swoop in and then help the locals and leave, all for a moral notch on their belt or a virtuous feather in their cap. But when I got there, I saw how grateful local people were for the influx of cash that helps their community and that helps protect their wildlife and their culture. Not to mention jobs. It's so beneficial when we do ethical ecotourism. There's so many ways that ecotourism can provide generous streams of revenue to the places that need it the most. Otherwise, people look for work elsewhere. They're they turn to illegal gold mining or <laughs> drug trafficking in order to put food on the table for their families. We can do something about this. We can change this. I know of a former sea turtle poacher who actually used to, ste to steal eggs to sell on the black market. And now he guides and hosts volunteers and tourists at, who want an ethical turtle experience. I know we all want to travel after COVID, but we must travel smarter, more intentionally and ethically. We must become the anti-tourist. I mean, <laughs> we could create a society in which people aren't selfishly motivated by money or power and inherently do what's right for future generations, but I'm not holding my breath. In the meantime, we must all be conservationists. Yes, even you. This quote exemplifies the new script we can write. It's not just about a tree-hugging hippie trying to save one random species of slug. No, when we work together to protect our wild places, we're preserving all of us, including humans, for when we support and sustain our ecosystems, we're supporting and sustaining ourselves. After all, Mother Earth has been quietly, efficiently, working in the background for billions of years. From brilliant butterflies to mysterious ocean creatures, we live on a beautiful planet. What if I told you that there was a job full of passion and purpose that protects biodiversity in all forms. Not just of flora and fauna, but of backgrounds, races, cultures, and identities. What if you could be part of this movement? It's time we heed the call for us all to be conservationists. We simply can't afford not to. Thank you.